Who doesn't love L.A. noir detective movies? This is the best, one of the best. It's Chinatown, a 1974 movie starring Jack Nicholson, directed by Roman Polanski. Let's take a look at why Chinatown is so beloved, why it's so interesting, why it's worth re-watching, coming up next. <laughs> Chinatown is written by the great screenwriter Robert Towns, who you should check out his filmography. All of his movies, most of them, are very well written. And, of course, this screenplay for Chinatown is lauded. Roman Polanski, not a great human being, but good director. And then Jack Nicholson starring in this. John Huston does a turn here. It's great. Faye Dunaway. All of these things come together in a movie that is absolutely classic L.A. detective noir stuff. Now, I'm going to recite the plot in a minute, but first, this movie reminds me of all the L.A. noir detective books I've read, and you should go read them if you like this movie, whether it's Dashiell Hammett's Maltese Falcon, Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, Farewell, My Lovely, and then my favorite, Ross MacDonald, one of the best writers of the 20th century, in my opinion, at least in terms of mysteries and detective stories. This movie, Chinatown, knows its history in terms of film noir and in terms of L.A. or just detective stories in general. And it shows up in this movie all over the place. It, it's got a lot of stuff in it for those of us who love reading those kinds of books. The character of Jake Geddes then is sort of like Philip Marlowe, sort of like, you know, the Dashiell Hammett, uh, Sam Spade character. But I find him to be unlikable, even a villain in this movie. He is vain and vulgar, and he's curious, as detectives are in these kinds of things, too curious and he ends up causing most of the problems in this movie not that it's all his fault but he's a catalyst of sorts for the very end of this movie which let's be honest as a noir it was going towards that fate at the end anyway but the detective is the one who sort of makes it all happen and the plot well actually, I actually won't recite the plot too much there's two parts to it one there's a there's an adultery story that the detective has to investigate here and then he gets into the problem of in you know in the 1920s and 30s the water rights problem in los angeles and how these western united states cities were created through water theft there's a very great book actually i love it mark reisner's cadillac desert about government shenanigans and a private shenanigans that created cities like Los Angeles by basically stealing water from all kinds of people and, and other cities like that. So go read Cadillac Desert because, you know, Chinatown's based on that sort of actual history, political history in the United States. And then you have L.A., the origin story of L.A. here. This is a 1974 movie about the 1930s talking about L.A.'s origins. And they're corrupt. They're monstrous. They're obviously mysterious. And when you go to the heart of the matter in this movie, as the detective does, trying to get to the truth locked inside a tight core that all these people are keeping secrets from, everybody else mostly, he finds terrible monstrosities, including sexual deviance. I won't bring that up. I won't spoil it for you, but something worse than adultery, obviously. Plus, at the same time, the water rights problem. Basically, giant theft, giant conspiracies. Now, this is a 1974 movie. And in the early 70s, late 60s, even mid 60s, you get a lot of conspiracy theorizing and a lot of Hollywood movies valorizing conspiracy theorizing. Take the Parallax View, for example, Soylent Green, the JFK assassination theories. This movie, although it's set in the past, is about a man trying to unravel a huge, deep conspiracy. And at the heart of which, as I said, is a monstrousness. This idea is in these sort of paranoid conspiracy theory movies. It's part of the zeitgeist of the time. And I would say, strangely, this movie goes together with, say, the parallax view. <laughs> so check that one out if you're interested in this kind of fare. One of the troubles with uh, uh, filming something like this is, you know, like Raymond Chandler, uh, you know, he uses the I, the first person narrator in that those are so rich and interesting. Ross McDonald's character as well. So what's the first person point of view in a movie? And movies can't really get inside a character's head very well. There's some techniques they use. And one of the techniques coming up here is a lot of first person sort of POV shots, point of view shots from behind the character, the Jake Geddes character played by Jack Nicholson, and a lot of handheld cam which is you know, not used a lot back then, but uh, definitely a lot these days, in the last 20 years especially. When you want to see a POV shot, as in a video game or movie, you follow the character who's turned away from you. You get that a lot in this movie. So that's the way I think this movie shows you Jake Geddes' point of view, which you, as the 
person, the viewer, seeing the camera linger around him, you get his POV, and that keeps you from knowing all the mysteries, which you would see otherwise if you have a different POV. So that's a really interesting technique in this movie used repeatedly, handheld cameras. And keeping you from the truth is media. So this movie begins, its opening shot is with photographs. And throughout the movie, you'll see different media being between the point of view of the detective and then the reality beyond the media. So you get newspapers, for example. You get binoculars, views through binoculars. You get cameras showing up in this movie. And as you go along, then finally the detective sort of gets rid of all those and he sees things for himself and as an eyewitness. It turns out it's worse to see things as an eyewitness than as through the media because the first shot is adultery. This case of the detective is unraveled. This Jake Getty's character for an ordinary guy and you see shots of adultery in the photographs. Well, that's a hint of what's to come, but it's better and easier than what Jake Keddies will literally see with his own eyeballs. And eyes show up throughout this movie, obviously punning on the private eye, the detective who is between the world of the police and the legal system and the world of crime. He's sort of got a foot in both, obviously, in the L.A. novels and detective novels and in this story. And the eyeballs come up here, so the bifocal lenses come up as an important a plot point and you'll see them one eye out and one eye is okay and i had to say this so this is a spoiler alert but the character who's shot in the end has one eye shot out and one eye remaining so this single eyeball idea and you know lacking one eye and not being able to see in part being blind in one eye that idea comes up throughout because jay gettys is fairly naive and he's missing a lot of details and if you know enough detective stories you'll be able to figure out who the killer is in this movie i think it's pretty easy to figure out pretty quickly in the movie but yet jake gettys is blind to all these truths that are sitting right in front of him literally so one eye blind as it were and then of course one of the ideas is that he's going he's uh, maimed his nose is cut in the movie and he's got a bandage a bandage over his nose, but that idea of being having one side scarred or maimed and one side is uh, you know pristine or handsome comes up a lot in this movie. Part of the world is nice, pristine, and handsome. Part of the world is scarred, bloodied, maimed, awful, and the detective is going from one side of that to the other. As I said, he has got two feet in two worlds: the legal system and the world of crime. Well, it's kind of like this idea of his face being sort of half and half. Now, again, you get those that sort of bifurcated image throughout this movie. One, at one point, he kicks out a tail light in a car, for example. So one eye is lit or one light is lit. The other eye is dark. You've got the bifocal lenses. You've got the character with the eye shot out and the, and the list goes on. So this image comes up throughout the movie of having one part of you screwed up, messed up, broken, and the other is nice and shiny looking. What's that a metaphor of? Everything. I mean, L.A. For itself, for example. It's a nice, shiny city on the outside. It's nice to look at. That's what tourists say or people who visit there. But once you get in there and see the seedy or gritty side or what it's really like or the corruptness of it, you'll see that it's broken and messed up. That's sort of what's going on here. And that's true of not just the city that Gettys inhabits, but also the characters, each character. And the movie, like all detective stories really, want to talk about the horrors within. On the outside, we're all nice, bright, and shiny, uh, like Mrs. Mulray in this movie. She's beautiful, she's rich, it's fancy at her house, and it looks all nice and proper. Once you see, start to look inside, it really at the interiors you'll see it's broken and screwed up and messed up horrific and so that idea of one side nice one side maimed comes up throughout the movie as a metaphor for exteriors and interiors and the detective story usually involves this guy who is motivated to solve a case not because of money here he is it is partly because of money but reputation as well and curiosity Detective stories like this tend to be curiosity narratives or anti-curiosity narratives in which the detective is a trespasser going into places he shouldn't and when he transgresses, you know, no trespassing signs, for example, he gets harmed or wounded or things get worse for him. And as I said, things get much worse for other people. You actually almost have a, a, an idea of creation and fall in this and these kinds of stories say like the Genesis 1 through 3 accounts where Adam sins in the garden the detective goes to a literal garden here the orange grove 
and breaks into it, transgresses, sins, and is harmed and wounded for it. And that's that continues on throughout this entire story, including the fact that the villain wants to create a garden in the desert through water and control of water. So he's sort of like a Pharaoh or even a Zeus-like figure creating, you know, the Nile Valley, as it were, or a garden in the or an oasis in the desert. And the, the detective is going to stop that. I don't think so. And he's a transgressor as much, I think, as the Pharaoh character, Noah Cross, played by John Huston in this movie. And you know this because throughout the movie, when you see shots of Jack Nicholson over and over again, maybe 50 times, you'll see Jack Nicholson and then the slanted uh, lines in this movie behind him. He doesn't have horizontal, nice, clean lines behind him as you would normally have in shots, stable shots of characters. You have unstable shots of, of diagonal lines and things going backwards. And, and that's what that's going to happen in the end of the movie. So things go backwards for him. Things are a slant. Things are unstable. Throughout the movie, the character Gettys is associated with that. And poor guy, he doesn't know what he's getting into. I'd love to know your comments because there's so much to say about this movie. Hours worth of material to say. So leave comments below. Hopefully you guys can read the comments. and It'll be great as my comments usually are on this channel. Please subscribe for more great content. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you and have a great day.